Welcome to the Adventure to Freedom Podcast. Welcome back to the Adventure to Freedom Podcast. Very excited for our guest here this morning. We have uh, Olympic silver and bronze medalist, the Pan Pacific Swimming Championship, triple gold medalist, and four-time Commonwealth Games champion, Ryan Cochran. Good to be here. Yeah, pleasure to have you here. <laughs> uh, so some things I wanted to talk about, let's dive right into it. Um, the Olympics, your experience training up for the Olympics and uh, getting to that, that uh, like ultimate goal. Yeah. <laughs> How often were you training when you were preparing for that? Well, it seems like a lot when I talk about it now, because mm. if I make it to the gym every day, it's, it's a win. Uh, but we were doing uh, five hours in the water, uh, about two to three hours outside the water. So like seven to eight hour day, wow, uh, day. five to six days a week. So it sounds like an incredible amount, but That's crazy. really when you start, it's like you start at eight years old and it's like, can you do a lap? And then you're like, can you do two laps? And so it's like, how do you build off that? Because we would add something every single month of every year, especially at the end of my career, but it's that's not how you start because it's it's just astronomical, right? <laughs> totally. Yeah. When I go swimming now casually, I, I swim maybe maximum a kilometer. When and I guess your best um uh event was the fifteen hundred? Yes. And I looked at the time and you did that in what, fourteen minutes or something like yeah, that? Yeah, fourteen and a half minutes. Yeah, I, I do a kilometer in like half an hour. <laughs> yeah. So that's insane. How, so these seven hour, eight hour days of training, what, what would that um, be built up of? So you're, you're in the pool for five hours, how far would you go? That's yeah. crazy. Uh, usually about 15 to 17K a day. Um, and yeah. <laughs> do you break that up or do you kind yeah. of? So yeah. it would be like two and a half hours in the morning with some dry land before it. Mm -hmm. uh, try to do some school in between if you if you wanted to. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, weights, dry land, another practice, and then usually some recovery after. So it was pretty full board from, you know, 5.30 in the morning to at least 5.30 at night. Yeah. That's insane. Yeah. <laughs> Hard to have a life. <laughs> wow. And so you'd swim like two hours, two hour chunks at a time? Uh, yeah, two to two and a half hours. Yeah. And so how, how far would you swim in that? On average, 8K eight, eight was pretty much, oh, seven to eight kilometers was my kind of general. And I'm just thankful I wasn't swimming in like the 1970s and 1980s because people during my event then did 10, 12, 15, 20 kilometer practices. A, a, wow. A practice, yeah, and you're doing that twice a day. And so it, it's it's still like, don't get me wrong, seven to eight K is a lot, but yeah. It's uh, it's made up of a lot of different things, and it's more interesting than I think it sounds to the... Right. You guys are switching up your strokes or degree. Are you trying to accomplish different um, different techniques and stuff as you're going? Yeah, you can't do the same thing for that long, or else mm. your shoulders would just explode. Yeah, and yeah. so, uh, you know, you're doing, like, leg-specific stuff, arm-specific stuff, different strokes, different heart rate levels. Mm -hmm. um, it's, yeah, you have to keep it interesting because it, it is it, it is monotonous when you look at that black line and it just keeps going, but uh, it's it's also, it there's the low point practices and then the high points. So mm -hmm. I used to, you know, dread our, you know, Tuesday night, Thursday night, because they were the hardest thing we'd ever do. Uh, but it was also those practices where you accomplish them and then yeah. you get out and you're like that much more proud of yourself for doing them. So why were they so much more difficult than just cause you have to have those high points in training and you can't, you can't expect to be full board all the time. Um, or else you'll get sick and, and break down and there's just no way to do it. So, right. uh, it's, you know, you had those kind of peak four or five practices a week that you mm -hmm. really focused on and the rest were kind of recovery supporting. Those oh, okay. Ones. And you said you, so you, different um, heart rates. So did you guys have like a heart rate monitors and something or? Uh, yeah, so we have uh, ones you put on your finger um, oh, okay. was one. And so depending, we use those mostly at like altitude. Uh, mm -hmm. On a day-to-day -day basis, you kind of just know a certain set will, will elevate it. And okay. the other sets are just pretty mediocre. But Interesting. when you're at, you know, if you're swimming in heat or at altitude or something that is going to push your body outside of its comfort zone, you mm -hmm. kind of have to keep track of that because... Uh, you don't want to like overheat or over, you know, do certain parts of the workout. And so is that, you say different temperatures and altitudes. So how did, how did you guys measure that? Would you, were you doing outdoor swims at all or was that? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, my favorite part of swimming was when we got to go to Hawaii or Australia or somewhere, <laughs> somewhere nice and turn outside and, and, and really focus just on sport. Um, and then at altitude, we do altitude training for a couple weeks every year. 
uh, in Flagstaff, Arizona. Uh, and so oh, okay. you, you have to be careful with that because it's this huge pressure put on your body uh, trying to do the same thing. Uh, mm -hmm. So you, we had a lot of sports scientists that helped us with that. And then there was a big team of, you know, we probably had 10 staff members in any given day. Really? Yeah. And what, would, what was... What were they doing? What were their jobs? <laughs> well, I mean, there it's pretty crazy that we had ten full time staff. That their yeah. entire job was so that you know I could ideally be 0.5 of a percent better. <laughs> That's what it takes, year, right? Like, or yeah. you know, 0.5 of a percent every four years. It's it's pretty uh, like astronomical. But yeah, uh, we had uh, dietitians, a couple sports scientists, mm -hmm. uh, physiologists, uh, performance like mental performance. It's kind of like multiple coaches, strength and conditioning. So. That's crazy. A big team, yeah. <laughs> That's a lot of pressure to have that many people trying to help and, and guide you in that. Well, and that was always funneled through our coach um, okay. because it's hard. When I was a more senior athlete, it was easy to manage those people because I they'd been supporting me for many years and I had great relationships with them. But uh, when you're starting out, you need a coach who can kind of funnel that into just certain aspects because you don't have time to think about all of this and what's good and what's right and what's wrong you know it's yeah. you need somebody to be able to be your advocate that's crazy were you on pretty strict um diets and stuff when you were doing you know, this training you don't really have to be yeah uh, because you're training so much right <laughs> so you could almost eat anything you want uh, <laughs> right. but it's i love talking about habits because mm. uh when I started working with a dietitian. I said, you know, tell me what to eat, what time of day, mm -hmm. and I'll eat it. And that lasted about 17 seconds. And, <laughs> uh, and so I, I, then we, we kind of figured out the best routine yeah. was eat healthy one day a week when you start and, and try to create that habit. Then move that to two after a couple months. And, mm -hmm. and then eventually after a couple of years, I found it was, I'd be reaching for the healthy stuff without even thinking about it. Right. Uh, and so it just became totally innate. And so, and it's chunking that down so that it's not so overwhelming right. when you first start. And I think that can be applied to anything. I guess training that much as well too. Um, anytime I've done lots of training, I would notice what I ate really, what I ate and when I ate really affected um, my my output and yeah. how much I could actually do or at what levels I was performing at. And some days it affects you more than others. Mm -hmm. um, we did some fasted training. So uh, I used to eat about seven, 8,000 calories a day. Uh, <laughs> not so much anymore. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that would be dangerous. Yeah. Uh, but I would eat before every training knowing because I didn't want to get to that 90 minutes or, you know, 120 right. minutes where you're just like, have no energy at all and mm. so I always ate and then we started introducing fast and training because they've there's some science that's shown that's help if Were you, they all about like ketosis and stuff back in? Uh, back not to then? the same amount as uh, people who do fast and training all the time but okay. we would just do a couple trainings a week just to see if yeah, that was it's anything you can do to make training a little bit harder so that's the right. same as altitude the same as training and heat the same as not eating before it's mm. all those things if you can get to the same result with more uh, against you yeah. than when everything's in your favor and stacking up for say a race day, uh, it should be easier in theory. Interesting. What was the what was then your ultimate like pre workout meal, pre workout fuel? Uh, I nothing in particular. Yeah. Yeah, like it's uh, people love the question of like, what's your favorite food? What yeah. was like, what was that magical food you had to eat before yeah. you raced? And it was just it just I think it wasn't as exciting at that time mm -hmm. because it's just eat as much as you can. Yeah, yeah. And so, I, you know, we tried to be adventurous, but in reality, it was like whatever is available. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a nice way to do it, though. I was, I was talking to Matt Sharp, and he said the same thing about, uh, you know, diet and, and food. When you're when you're working that much, it's, you're burning through it. That's great. Yeah, and it's, it's I, I, I loved the idea of when we got to the Olympics, you get this, you walk into the food hall, and there's, you know, stations from all over the world. And instead of thinking, oh, I don't have this, you know, exact thing that I ate at home, my right. whole week's ruined. You're like, let's go adventure and just eat whatever we want, whatever's going to make us happy. Yeah. Uh, because you know that that's going to put you in the right mindset to be able to race. Right. And you've created those habits that you're choosing the right things anyways. Interesting. Yeah. I, I, I guess more, the more you do exercise or more active you are, I find too, even for myself, like I am more attracted to uh, healthier foods. When you're tired, yeah. yeah. And I think instead of being too particular what you're eating, I mean, some mm -hmm. people need that, 
power over what they're doing mm -hmm. and it, that it backgrounds them a bit. For me, it was, you know, everything, you, when you're going to a competition in China, you're not going to be able to get the same products and yeah. you can only bring so much with you. Totally. And so you kind of have to just go with the flow and, you know, know things that aren't going to be available and just figure it out. Wasn't there, wasn't it, uh, I don't know if it was a rumor or not, but Usain Bolt just ate chicken nuggets or something when he was... I think he did that just for a sponsorship from McDonald's. Because <laughs> uh, he got one after, so... Oh, you know, really? Yeah, it's... it's People like that actually kind of piss me off. Um, yeah. Because I feel like it's very flippant towards anybody else that's doing everything they can yeah. to just even be there. Or even have the right. dream of going, kind of thing, right? And somebody who's like, ah, I just ate all the McDonald's in the world, it's like, that's not sending the right message. Like, maybe yeah. you did that, but why are you selling this ideal... Yeah, uh, it's almost showing off a bit more, but that's, mm. I mean, maybe that's part of the event, right? Like, it's all about bravado for the those sprint races, and so right. I think that's just another kind of thing Feather has had, he's hoping for. <laughs> yeah, but I found that interesting, too. Sometimes in, uh, I think it was Anderson Silva in uh, UFC was sponsored by Burger King or something, and I was like, <laughs> you've never had Burger King. Like, there's no way you're eating Burger King. <laughs> they'll do it, they'll do it for the money, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, going back to something you said earlier, um... So you kind of broke down the seemingly big task of, of eating healthy into smaller steps. Uh, did you find that you, do, you did that a lot with training, is kind of breaking down these bigger goals into smaller achievable ones? Oh, I think you have to because, I, you know, when I was a kid, I said I wanted to go to the Olympics. And how, how old were you when you uh, I remember saying that at uh, like grade four. Wow. And uh, the inevitable question was, oh, and what? And I'd say, I have no idea. <laughs> but that was right. just like, what do you want to be when you grow up kind of thing. Mm. And so, you know, at, when you're starting out in a sport, you have to chunk things down because your goals, whether they're, you know, to be the best in your city, the country, just better yourself, doesn't matter. Right. But that, that, that can be years away, right? Mm -hmm. And so how do you you make sense of that so that every day it doesn't seem daunting and so I always broke uh, my goals down to you know there was the four-year goal maybe the ultimate goal for my career and yeah. then uh, yearly goal monthly goal weekly goal and then even practice because you know some days I just drag my feet and wouldn't want to be there right. uh, but I was like okay today's goal is not necessarily to be happy and have the best practice ever it's mm -hmm. it's focus on this one set that you know is important right and then you always get through it and you move on and then you don't think about it again how did you did you how did you keep track of these goals did you write them down or did you was that part of your I've done it all well? yeah <laughs> so I've done the like put the goals on the wall as affirmations and try to say it every day mm -hmm. I've had it where I just like we talk about it once at the beginning of the year and don't talk about it again uh, but I was I did have my coach who would hold me to that goal mm -hmm. um, and then once I had been in sport for about 15 or 10 or 15 years it's like you hold yourself to those goals and right. you know what you're working towards and there's days you forget about it but that's usually the days you're pretty broken down and tired and yeah. it's okay not to think about your goals that day right sometimes but, a goal can just be getting through that you know 100 like yeah, uh, yeah just uh, that's the thing like i wasn't i always talk about how i wasn't really the happiest like most excited person for sport mm. doesn't mean i didn't like it it's just i wasn't ever gonna wake up with a smile on my face at 4 45 in the morning like it wow. wasn't gonna happen okay <laughs> and so for me it was like put one foot in front of the other and mm. just show up <laughs> that's that's amazing to hear that coming from you and like that being such a huge part of your life and you saying that you weren't exactly stoked to get up and, and well, it's, do it. You know, I, I was fortunate that I had a lot of friends who retired before me. And mm -hmm. so I kind of had a better appreciation when I was well into my 20s that what I was doing was pretty cool. And, yeah. you know, not often in life you get to focus 100% on yourself uh, and get to be an athlete, right? So yeah. I had that appreciation, but I, the alarm would go off and I'd just be like, oh, I just want to sleep for six more hours. Mm. But you get up, you, you do your routine, you have those habits, and so you just keep moving forward, and I think that's pretty helpful. And was was it the Olympics that was your kind of your North Star during that, or what? How did you get yourself out of bed when you didn't want to get out of bed? Uh, I don't know. I, I remember having this very kind of visceral argument with my coach, because he wanted us to put our feet on the ground and say, like, yay, swimming, mm -hmm. and, and be excited and happy when we woke up. Yeah. And I remember just arguing for what seemed like days, just being <laughs> yeah. like, that's never, ever going to be me, right? Yeah. And, but I have, like, I hadn't missed a practice in seven years at that point. And so it's kind of oh, like, wow. it, it wasn't that I needed to be happy. And I, I get now, looking back on it, it's like, for the people around me, like the younger athletes, right. they were probably like, oh, he always complains. <laughs> like he said, like he's always saying something, right? Yeah. But I would... You were setting kind of an example. That you I guess so. Wanted. But, yeah. you know, I 
kind of complain, but then I put my head down, push off the wall, and still do what I needed to do. Yeah. Uh, so it's finding that balance that works for you, and but also being aware that you influence the people around you. Interesting. Yeah, that's an, a, an interesting perspective on that too. Um, did you and did that ever change, or did you was like, <laughs> did you get excited when you were getting ready for? Uh, a specific event. Uh, like there was always the excitement. Event. Don't get me wrong. Like I mean, especially you. Uh, you know, if the weather's nice and you're somewhere foreign and you, mm. you you know, you're like, this is a pretty cool life that we have, and like yeah. you're excited to go to the pool and see what you can do. Uh, it wasn't, I guess, that I was ever negative. I just was never positive. Like a lot of the time, I was neutral, <laughs> okay, and yeah. uh, and that worked for me. Like I, it. Uh, but I, I think it's, I was always excited about the end goal mm -hmm. and there was lots of part of it that I was excited about, but it's just that like initial waking up in the morning sometimes. Like, it's hard to be really positive first thing in the morning. And knowing that you have eight hours of work to do. Yeah. <laughs> right? uh, it's, I can't even imagine like, it, that's crazy to be in the pool for that long. Well, and that's the thing, like I'd, we'd have these practices that you knew were going to like you were probably going to barf after they were going to be like the hardest thing you've ever done. And especially in Olympic year, it's like you try to push yourself more and more and more and more, like always more. And, uh, yeah. so I remember like, just like being terrified of certain, like a certain set being mm. just knowing how hard it was going to be. Uh, but I always got through it. I never really failed. There was days that were much better than others, but right. I, I, after, you know, quite a few years, you're like, okay, I'll, I'll at least start this. And I yeah. think that's like something that's a good takeaway for anybody. It's like, it, it put one foot in front of the other and just start. Right? Yeah. And whether you finish or not is a different conversation, but most of the time you probably will right. um, because you just started. Where most of us have this fear mm. of starting something that's difficult uh, because you don't know. We're all kind of like 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 to have power on a situation. Mm. And so all I can say is just throw yourself into the situation and see what happens and you'll probably be suppressed. Right. It's that comfort. that. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, it's so easy to be comfortable and then to, to break out of that. I like how you said that though, that just the start, because uh, for my, like, I don't swim that often, but when I do, like the hardest part of swimming for me is getting to the pool. Yeah. Once I'm yep. in there, I'm like, okay, like I'm going to do this. And then it's, it's always really enjoyable. Yeah. Um, what, uh, how, what do you think about when you're on those long swims? Uh, it's funny. My least favorite question is mm. when people used to ask, they're like, oh, you must sing a song or, you know, like you, know, you must daydream. Yeah. And uh, I think I probably could list off 300 things that I should be thinking about at any given moment when I was yeah. in the water. And so you're always thinking about your stroke rate, your stroke count, mm. uh, how you pushed off the wall, what your hand's doing. Like everything we did was down to kind of millimeters different. Right. And you had to repeat it. 500 times for it to actually be like ingrained even remotely right and so it was always you know we're getting feedback on you know almost like a lap by lap basis and mm. so you're trying to just focus on that and perfect it every single time mm. which seems crazy now that i look back on that because yeah. you know the feedback loop was so quick mm. and you're, you're just constantly trying to work that into what you're doing and i i, I look towards my job now and the, there is a feedback but not remotely the same like if you get feedback once a week it's a positive kind of thing, right. right so uh it's getting used to those changes but if you, would you stop at every um like you do a length or you do a like a, a small workout and then you get feedback or would it be after every our repeats were anywhere from you know 50 meters to mm -hmm. like 400 meters right at the most uh and so maybe 800 the odd time but you're swimming for between 30 seconds and, and six minutes kind of thing. And in between that, whenever you stop at the wall, the coaches, someone is usually there right. to give you feedback because you, every lap is a chance to be better. And so yeah. you need to make the most of it. Wow. That's it. It, it, it. That must've been nice though, too, to have like stuff you could immediately put into action and start to, to work on. Uh, 95% of the time yeah. and the other 5% of the time you want to be like stop correcting me right, right I guess eh? <laughs> and you always have to remember that they're never just saying oh that was good <laughs> yeah right like, <laughs> yeah. And sometimes I, I always thought about like having a cone and you're mm. just having a bad day like put the cone up and just be like just leave me alone for an hour right right but Get the alone cone yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you always have to remember that those people are there to make you better and it's mm. the same with like a boss in a career where like you constantly feel like they're picking on you but their job is to make you better and like right. that's their entire career and so uh remembering that and reminding yourself i think is it's pretty important that sounds pretty mentally stressful though as well like how did you deal with um like that 
almost feedback of you got to be better. Like that's not you're not good enough, not good enough. Like keep keep going, keep getting better. You know, when you're a kid, it's pretty easy because you think you can accomplish anything. Mm -hmm. And probably went around when my early 20s is when I started to do well, but I was kind of always second. And it was like silver medal, silver medal, silver medal, mm -hmm. everything that I did. And so kind of three or four years into that, then you start to get the self-doubt of like, am I, is this the best I'm going to do? Like, am I crappy? Am I like, why aren't I progressing? And the self-doubt is probably the biggest, uh, you can probably blame on lack of results is I would say on self-doubt from anybody. And right. um, whether it's like taking that first step or whether you're in the moment and things start to get hard and mm -hmm. you know, my race, because it was 15 minutes, I always wish I did a shorter race, but you yeah. know, right around <laughs> like, crazy. at least I wasn't doing like a marathon, I guess, but right around kind of like seven or eight minutes, that self-doubt is like yelling at you in your head. Like mm. maybe you didn't train enough. Maybe you're not good enough. Maybe like they're faster. Maybe they're just genetically better. Like, mm. and whether you're actually thinking that or not, it, it, it feeds into your sense of self and your ability to actually overcome that pain yeah. and so I, I think yeah everybody can relate to that in some degree and, mm. and how do you just kind of uh, minimize that and I am an advocate for saying that's totally normal and just knowing that the people beside you are thinking the same thing instead of trying to shut that down completely which mm. isn't going to happen you could just say every single you know across the pool there's eight swimmers every single person is having that thought in their head right now yeah and so how do you just normalize it and move on instead mm. of trying to stop it completely how in the race though would you was there anything you would do to kind of to quiet that or to to keep your focus on on the task at hand uh it's just focusing on racing focusing mm -hmm. on get, just getting one arm in front of the other especially when it gets really tough is right. um it, most you hope at that point most of its habits and then mm -hmm. you're just racing uh but if you have to start focusing on little things to get yourself just to keep going forward then you do that but there's no right answer on that one <laughs> when, when you're in a race like that are you uh are you focused on the, your your competitors or is it is it more of a you, you've done the training, you're going to swim your race. Uh, focusing on the competitors, for sure, because it's human nature to always mm -hmm. want to, like, watch, race, know. Like, that's what motivates you in the moment. Yeah. And you hope that those millions and millions of meters that you've done has ingrained your technique to where it needs to be. Because right. it's really, like, I remember having plans for every 100 meters of my 1500. Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't think of, like... 90% of <laughs> any of those points because you're yeah. focusing on racing and it's exciting and it's loud and, yeah. and so then we're like okay one set of every 300 meters so then it's down to like five things to think about mm -hmm. think about something at that point and so it, it's it was always a moving target it took kind of 10 years to perfect for sure wow the mental game of racing at such an elite level seems crazy as you said you know the self-doubt and then just trying to stay focused. Um, what sort of strategies did um, you implement from kind of sports psychology or on that uh, regard? Uh, I should probably remember this more than I do. <laughs> uh, you know, I worked with quite a few sports psychologists mm -hmm. and kind of grabbed something from each of them mm -hmm. um, because some were a bit more, uh, you know, laissez fair, not in a bad way, but, you know, go with it, see how it goes. Like, instead of worrying about everything, just kind of, Right. Keep moving forward. Others were much more tangible with their um, kind of thought process of mm -hmm. you need to think about these things at this point. So I kind of found an equilibrium between them all. But uh, I think to overcome that, it's just uh, habits and normalization. Like it's, it's mm -hmm. really, it's nothing too crazy, right? It, there's always, you know, breathing exercises, right. uh, uh, kind of imagining the races in your head. And they've had some kind of MRI studies that have shown that that can be quite helpful, but I think it just depends who you like are. Like right? vi visualizing the races. Like visualizing all your races, visualizing being on the podium, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of feeds into positive affirmations, that kind of stuff. Yeah. And we actually talk about that in our office a lot now mm -hmm. for my new job. And some of the stuff I take away where I'm like, that's a huge positive. I can see that working for me. And the other stuff you, you, it, you can appreciate it, but you're like, I don't know if that's for me, but keeping an open mind is the most important because, right. um, we're all very, we think we know what we need to be doing, but it takes somebody else sometimes to point things out. For sure. Uh, you, you keep mentioning the power of habit. How did that uh, guide you in, in your training and, I guess, in your life now as well? How do you use the power of habit? Uh, oh, that's a good question. I, I, 
I have habits now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my habits are to have habits. Mm. Uh, <laughs> That's yeah, a good habit. Yeah. yeah. Um, Wait, how do you go about building them? And, yeah. It's self patience is a big one. Like mm. things don't happen right away. Right. Um, and so when I was starting my career, uh, you know, a year and a bit ago, um, I was thinking that is how do you build habits and start things in the right way so that you know and have patience that it's not going to happen overnight, but mm. you'll eventually create these things that you don't have to think about everything as much. And uh, it right. was interesting, kind of the bumpy road when you start something new, mm -hmm. uh, where you have to think about everything. And it's so much mental capacity to uh, make sure you, you know, you've plugged all the holes in your ship because like you yeah. feel like you're sinking kind of thing at any given time. Mm -hmm. And so even after six months, I started to see, okay, I've created some habits where I don't have to think about everything so much. And then you move right. on to bigger and better things. And so it's, I, I think, have the end goal that's the biggest thing mm. uh but then also have goals along the way that are going to create those habits to get you there um because right. if you're always thinking of i need that million dollars i need mm. that career i need that family whatever that looks like mm. is it can be so daunting that totally it can just be maddening to even focus on that so i think right. it's just chunk it down and it's it's a lot easier right breaking it down into steps and that new career that you're mentioning too is so that's in victoria real estate it is. And we're going we're gonna to dive into that uh, in a little bit. But before we do, um, just back to the habits for a little bit, because that's, that's really interesting. Um, how did you find, like, I guess when you were doing your training, um, a lot of those habits were built and, and kind of helped along with, uh, with a lot of your coaching staff and, and um, for sure. the people helping you there. But... What was it that kept you, because I mean, you can have people telling you to do stuff, but how did you, uh, you know, keep those habits to yourself? Like, how did you make sure that you, you're building your own habits properly um, on your end? Uh, I think it started when I was quite young, mm. um, because long story short, my twin brother was always a better athlete, and so oh, I had okay, to yeah. create habits to try to better myself at a faster pace than everyone else mm. uh, because I was terrible. <laughs> and so you can't just expect to progress to the same as everyone else because right. you need to play catch up. And that's the same if you're starting a new job. It was the same when I was, you know, as our whole Canadian team, we were good mm. and we were progressing, but at the exact same rate as everyone else. So we we're always at like a kind of medium level. And so how do you get better is that you need to make that big jump. Mm. Uh, and so when I was younger, creating those habits of, you know, you might not be the fastest, you might not even be the strongest or the best at what you're doing, but mm -hmm. what am I doing every day to just get a little bit better and, th and be, you know, conscious of it? Because a lot of us, you, if you're not thinking about trying to be better mm -hmm. in what you're doing, it can be a week, it can be a year, you, you know, it can be a couple days, you can just like fly by and not even think about it. We all know that feeling. Yeah. And so, you know, being aware in the moment is going to be that first step that's going to uh, allow you to create those habits. Did you find, did you ever get into any sort of training ruts that you, you weren't seeing the progress uh, that you wanted to see? And then how did you get out of that? Uh, well, I mean, my last four years was that pretty much. Okay. <laughs> of your last uh, four years of, of training? Yeah. Like it, it's actually, I shouldn't say that. The training always got better. Mm -hmm. um, but then, you know, the best example is in, in Rio, my last Olympics, mm -hmm. uh, the training all year was the best I had ever had. Mm. Uh, and then I was just in this rut where I just couldn't go best time. And whether that was about my age, uh, you know, psychological circumstances, who knows? It's a whole like gamut of, of things. But yeah. uh, I was just in this rut that like my best time was from four years earlier from the last Olympics. And, mm. and really my first Olympics, so to my last, over mm. three Olympics, eight years, and I only took off one second, <laughs> uh, which is like, or two seconds maybe. I actually don't even that's know what the best time is. That's a lot. In, uh, but over 14 yeah. minutes and 40 seconds or whatever it is, like it's not really that much. Like mm. really that's, you know, just trying like a little bit harder into the wall could be a second. Like it's, yeah. it's, it's, or just having a stronger last stroke into every wall could be five seconds if you really do it. But right. it's, it's just amazing as, as elite athletes, you're, <laughs> you're putting so much time and energy and all these other people are putting that much time and energy mm -hmm. and just for like the smallest, smallest amount. Right. And it's yeah. even, it's even more, uh, kind of bl mind blowing when you look at those smaller races where like the people who do the 50 or the hundred instead mm -hmm. of what I did. So their races are 21 seconds and they're right. trying to get a, hundredth of a second better yeah. and that would be a win kind of thing right how did you so 
I feel like you're like getting to this elite level. Like you're you're training at a different or and performing at a, at a different level than a lot of people out there. Because um, I think a lot of people, myself included, like we'll get to you know maybe we're having a swim and we might be getting close to a, a like a pain threshold or kind of getting close to what we think we can do. Yeah. But I feel for for you, you're then probably pushing past that or how did you get to that kind of threshold of of your potential uh, a lot of it's pre-planned mm -hmm. so you if you go if you dive in the water you go for a run and you don't actually plan out a workout and you just kind of go to do it okay. and I do this all the time mm -hmm. uh, it's really hard to push yourself to that pain tolerance you have a good day it's no problem but mm -hmm. most days you know you get close to that and you're like, oh, I'm tired, uh, you know, yeah. maybe I did enough. Like it's, so if you have a pre-planned day where I'm going to do this set, like I'm going to do mm -hmm. this repeat on this time and hold yourself to it right. and you start doing that more often and you say like, so we would do the same practices every, you know, every week or two, mm -hmm. we'd have the same practices. So one week we'd, we'd do it, the next week we'd try to beat it, and the next week we'd try to beat it again. And right. so it's it's measuring yourself is the number one thing that people don't do. You know, mm -hmm. they go for a swim, they're like, I'm gonna do thirty laps. Yeah. Maybe there's some of it's timed, but if it's it's that grandiose, it's really hard to know whether you're progressing or not. Mm hmm Interesting. Cause that that's uh especially with like running or swimming, I'll kinda you know, especially if I know that I have a long way to go still, then I'll just kinda keep it mellow and then yeah, most people do, right? Mm. Like, I go for a run, and I, I'm like, okay, today should be a hard run. Mm. Then I start running, and, like, yeah. like, it's hard, but it's, like, is it hard? Like, I, mm. have I actually measured myself? Like, do I even know what my time was? No. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it, and it's really, that self-doubt creeps in pretty quickly of, you right. know, as soon as you start to, say, do sprints, you're going to be like, uh, like, I don't feel good today. Yeah. Like, I did a couple, and I, I feel like that's enough where if you had planned it out for the entire week and mm -hmm. it was six days before and you had already, you were like, nope, on, you know, six days from now, I'm going to do this set. Mm -hmm. You're more rewarded, I think, if you do do it and you will progress faster. And did you, so you planned out, like every week you would plan out, this is what we're doing this week and... Well, I wouldn't. Stay strict <laughs> Somebody would tell me what to do. Yeah, it, uh, the... I mean, most of our, so like every Tuesday night was mm. a similar, not necessarily the exact same, but we knew it was going to be very high intensity. Yeah. We knew every Thursday morning was going to be longer, but medium intensity. So it was kind of the same generalized week in, week out. Um, and then you add and take away stuff, but right. the sets themselves would be a bit different because you drive yourself crazy if you did the same right. thing every single day of every single week. <laughs> a lot of people think of swimming too, or as, as very monotonous. But, um, like someone was asking, we were talking about what we think about when we swim and I'm, I'm just flailing. So I'm trying to, like, <laughs> like you were saying, <laughs> I'm trying to think, think a little bit about what I'm trying to do. Yeah. <laughs> um, what is one thing that, um, for an amateur swimmer like myself or any amateur swimmers out there that someone could do to incre like improve their swimming kind of immediately that a lot of people don't know about? Wear goggles. Yeah, that's key. <laughs> um, and then I would say the two biggest are, uh, I'll give you three. Mm -hmm. uh, hip position is a big one. Okay. So people drop their hips, and as soon as you drop your hips, your legs drop, and then you're just pulling everything. Okay. So really think about having your hips as close to the surface of the water mm -hmm. as you can. Um, and however you do that, whether you put a kickboard under so you know what it feels like, whether you focus on building your leg strength, but you need your hips close to the surface or else you're just producing too much um, surface area, like being right. pulled. Uh, ankle flexibility is a huge one. So most people's ankles only kind of flex to here. Mm -hmm. You need to make sure that they're as straight as they can right. um, because that'll just give you that much more propulsion mm -hmm. um, and less drag, which is a huge one. And uh, breathing is a big one. Most people breathe like head up. Mm -hmm. um, head up, drops your hips right away, and then you're just dragging, like, more body, yeah. right? And so always breathe to the side and think of, like, your whole body on, like, a string, mm -hmm. and the string always stays level with the water. And so when we would actually breathe, our, our face wouldn't even really come out of the water. The water would actually dip below our face uh, because of the surface area. So if you ever see a swimmer and you, you Google a photo, mm -hmm. it's like the water actually dips lower than like what would be even. And so it's oh, like okay. minimizing your head position as much. So side to side, not up and down is, is probably the biggest. Wow. 
How, how do you deal with uh, drinking all that pool water? <laughs> well, that's the thing. It's like you just don't. Right? Yeah. And, and it's you. We were so fine on what we were doing mm-hmm. that you would probably like the average person probably drinks far too much. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we would probably drink relatively nothing. Okay. Well, how do you? Because no matter what, anytime I go swimming, like afterwards, I'm like I I drank some pool water and it's. It, is it just that head position or yeah it, it's when you're splashing and it, mm. it's more forced to try to pull yourself through the water yeah it's kind of inevitable that you're going to get some water in your mouth but yeah. uh when you're when it's smoother and it's more precise and you're less there's like we really there wasn't really any splashing like our mm. kick would be below the surface most of the time and then you try to get your hand in as smooth as possible and so your your face could come out of the water and no water would be splashing at you right what um what is proper form? Like, how do you, how are you supposed to put your arms in the water? That sounds like a stupid question, but like, uh, is it is there like a set technique that works for everybody, or do you find, you know, at that elite level that there is subtle differences in the way that? Uh, are we talking like freestyle front crawl? Like yeah. I did? Um, there's a couple ways. Some people do straight arm, um, mm-hmm. but that's usually in the in the shorter distances. Okay. Um, the point was always when you're you want to have wide elbows and when your arm goes in you want to roll your body so that your arm can go as far in as possible so the the it's like having straight feet uh when your arm goes in you want to be able to pull water from here to your elbow Mm. most people put the water in and they try to do i broke my wrist so it doesn't really work anymore uh but they try to just use their their hand and so really focusing on your hand to elbow should be as straight as possible when it goes in the water so that it's just a surface area thing, right? Like if you can pull your whole body with this, it's, you know, three times what your hand is. Yeah. And, but most of us, it's like you focus on your extremities. So that's what you mm-hmm. think. You think you're almost like pulling yourself through the water, like pulling a rope. Yeah. Uh, but really you should be propelling your body forward with more surface area in your arm. And you kind of go in straight down after that? Well, you, you put your arm yeah. in and then you, you're going to like roll your shoulders into mm-hmm. it so that you can pull as much as possible with that arm did, and hand. Did you guys break this all down? Like, would you look at tapes of yourselves and stuff or break it down? Yeah, that would be a part of it. Yeah. Um, because a lot of the time, and this would drive our coaches crazy, mm-hmm. um, a lot of the time they would tell you to do something and you'd be like, you'd do a couple laps, and you'd be like, yep, so it's better. And they're like, you did not change anything. And right. uh, the problem with swimming is like, you think you changed something this much. Mm-hmm. And in reality, you changed it like a quarter of an inch. Right. Uh, and it's something to do with like the, the being in a different paradigm and, and being in the water instead of on the air. Like it's, mm-hmm. it's just, it's all kind of different, but uh, I always tell younger athletes that I'm like, your coach is going to keep telling you the same thing. It's going to drive you crazy because mm. you think you fixed it. Right. Uh, but just, you almost have to overdo everything you can to, to kind of correct it. And then you'll probably be where they want you to be. How would you, what, what's some advice you would give to people who wouldn't have uh, a staff of, you know, or a team helping them out um, to keep themselves focused and uh, to keep improving? Uh, I mean, to keep focused, uh, that's a hard one. I think it has to come from you. Uh, Mm -hmm. it's lack of focus. Uh, maybe that's lack of investment. Maybe there's too much else going on in your life. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of things that can influence that, but, um, trying to be present when you're like, when you go and do something, Mm -hmm. um, because you're there doing it. Like why waste time thinking about 17 other things if you can just focus on that. And I find swimming can be quite meditative because the minute you push off the water, dive in the water, it's quiet. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, take that opportunity to like, if you're just going to go do some laps, it's like, maybe you're not trying to progress, but maybe that's like, you're getting some activity and it's your quiet time. Right. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's appreciate that because Mm -hmm. if you're not, you know, what are you there doing? Right. Right. Just kind of stay in the moment. Um, do you do any other sort of mindfulness exercises? Like any of out of water meditation or anything like that? Uh, I don't. Mm. Um, I've been trying to implement that more. Um, as I say, a lot of people I work with find that really, really helps them. Mm. Um, I am a bit of a cynic, so it's <laughs> try to be open minded with, and I know that's helped a lot of people. Yeah. Um, and so I find it's it's a constant battle to uh, implement those things, utilize them, and then keep utilizing them because they yeah. are important. Do you still do you still swim now? Not at all. Really? Wow. <laughs> Um, what do you do for exercise now? Just run and uh, run and gym? bike and go to the gym. Yeah. Uh, to you know, 
I do like swimming, but mm. there's so many other exciting things to do outside. Yeah. And uh, I, it's, I think it's more exciting to be able to be out in nature, and especially Victoria, where you can be out all year round. It's, yeah, totally. Appreciate that, and maybe in a couple of years I'll go back. Yeah, I mean you've done, you've put in enough time. Yeah, Twenty years is enough. Yeah, <laughs> for the time being. Uh, what's been your favorite sort of uh, event so far? So you've competed. I was, I was looking it up earlier, and you competed a lot more than I thought. I thought uh, it was, you know, maybe the Olympics, but then it was, um, you know, the uh, World Aquatics, um, and then the Pan Pacific. And yeah, so it was every year we would have at least one major yeah. uh, championships, uh, yeah. sometimes two. So uh, Olympics, obviously, every four years. A World Championships was every two. Uh, and then the other years we'd have a Pan Pacifics, Commonwealth Games, mm -hmm. a Pan Am Games. Like, there's always some big multi-sport games yeah um and then within that you know you have two nationals a year there's always about 10 other competitions you go to so every year was pretty packed but it was uh there was always that main focus for every season right um usually it was a world championships or an olympics and then you know you move on to the next year and so it was very cyclical by the year mm -hmm. um which is you know weird when you leave sport because you're like yeah. you always planned a year out like it's you had right. your whole year planned and like there'd be some changes, but you just move on after like year after year, you have another chance. And I remember, you know, whether results were great or terrible, mm. you'd finish that come off games and you'd be like, okay, that was awesome. And you're like, okay, what's next year? And it was just right. always that like, it's like total chapters of your life mm -hmm. uh, where in the real world, it's, there's no separation year to year. Right. It's, right. It all just kind of slogs. Into it's all, all an illusion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Those people doing the oh, January 1st, starting something new, but it's, you're right. It's, well, and, and, there is something to be said about that. Mm. Like it's not necessarily need to have these big goals for a year, but you know, yeah. start off the year knowing it's a new year. And mm. so you, I kind of get that. It, it totally is a good uh, yeah. metaphor. It's weird though. Sometimes even like uh, if you're trying to implement a new habit, but it's like a like a you know like a Wednesday. You're like, oh, I'll wait till Monday. You know? Yeah, it's a weird yeah. thing. Um, was it the feeling different at uh, you know the World Championships or versus the Olympics? Like, was it? Did it feel different? Uh, the Olympics is always different. Mm -hmm. All the other competitions, you know, World Championships was more important than a Commonwealth Games or yeah. a Pan Am Games, but generally there was always similar people. And if mm -hmm. there weren't, your time still mattered to try to be the top in the world that year. Right. Um, and so you get to that big competition and to me it wouldn't feel any different. Mm -hmm. The vibe might have been different, but, you know, your focus was always the same. Uh, but the Olympics is just like that on steroids. Like it's yeah. <laughs> maybe that's a lack of better term for <laughs> for the Olympics nowadays, <laughs> yeah. uh, or any of the people I race. But the uh, it's you know it, you knew you only had very very few chances at it, and mm -hmm. you know I was very fortunate to go to three games. But um, that even said, like my first games, it's like that was your chance. You had dreamed your whole life to be at that point. Like yeah. you better perform. And then, like, you know, you know, I had planned to go to two more, but who knows? I could have broken my leg, like, the next year until mm -hmm. we've been out, right? And so knowing that, that it could be your once-in-a-lifetime chance right. um, can be pretty scary. And I yeah. remember our dietitian was a bit worried about me because every Olympics, and without a doubt, I would lose, like, 15 pounds going into it because of stress. Oh, okay. And so they'd just be, like, then I'd go up to 10 or, like, like thousand calories or more and they'd yeah. be just like pouring like protein shakes down your throat and just yeah. like please put the weight back on and you're like you couldn't do anything to avoid it and mm -hmm. it's amazing what that kind of like stress or energy can take a toll and that didn't happen you didn't get that same kind of stress for no the other time no yeah. how did it feel to finally get to that but yeah, that first olympic games you did and you're, you're showing up and the, which where was the first one you did beijing was my first games okay. which was uh always really interesting because they made sure everything was perfect. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, a communist country, it's pretty easy to do it. Uh, but <laughs> they, it, it was like, everything was precise. It was just as kind of like magical as I ever imagined. Like I remember being yeah. woken up on the very first night and this was the night before I had my first race mm -hmm. at like uh, pretty late, but it's because they had so many fireworks going off that it sounded yeah. like a bomb was exploding. Right? <laughs> because it was just like, like I, I think they spent like hundreds of millions of dollars on fireworks and you're like, wow. okay, this is pretty cool. You're like, yeah. it's a big deal. Mm -hmm. And then you start to think, I remember thinking I wasn't nervous enough. And so before my race, you're like, you okay. weren't nervous enough. Well, like it's this too is relaxed. the biggest thing <laughs> yeah. of your life potentially ever. Like mm -hmm. it's like, and it, in retrospect, not, but when you're in the moment, yeah. it, Definitely feels that way. Isn't it a good thing to be a little relaxed, though, to 
perform? De- depends who you are. Yeah. Uh, for me, I had to feel that nerves right. uh, because it was that jittery energy that I needed. Some mm-hmm. people, that could destroy them. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I remember thinking, you know, how many people are going to watch this? And you start going down the line, you're like, there could be a billion people watching this race. Like, yeah. And especially because I raced a lot of Chinese athletes. And so right. there legitimately could be a billion eyes on, <laughs> on this race, which is... Yeah just a, yeah it, it a was stress it was and it's so bad it was too much and it's finding that balance of what works for you mm. and so you're you you wake woken up by all these fireworks and uh how long were you in beijing before you actually did your that that race uh we were probably the games for three days mm. uh before uh anywhere from three to seven days depending if we have a staging camp nearby um but i had two races at the olympics so i raced always day one and then day seven and day eight, so I had to be ready right away, and then I'd mm. go back to do some work, and then I'd have my better race. At the end. Would you have some time to, to climatize or like, go into the pool and? Yeah, so that was kind of what those three days were for, mm. uh, and we'd always be at a training camp that was within the same time zone. So before Beijing, we were in Singapore. Oh, okay. Um, Just before more. London, we were in Italy, and so you go and train so you can get used to the heat, the time change, and then mm-hmm. we just do a short flight up. Right. And then go into the village. In in Rio, we were there a week out because you couldn't really train anywhere that was nearby. And right. that was a long time to be in the Olympic Village, like, excited about it. And mm-hmm. have to just wait day after day after day after day yeah, yeah. <laughs> to race. And, and really, from that point to my, my 1500 was almost two full weeks. Mm-hmm. And then we also stayed the next week after that. So it's, it's, it's a long, it's a long haul. <laughs> How does it feel to, particularly that first Olympics... You've done, you know, your. F- how old were you when you did when you were in Beijing? Uh, nineteen. So, you've had what fifteen years of, of hard training with that as your your ultimate goal, and you're up there on the starting block, and you're like, how does how does that feel? Uh, well, I have very vivid memories before each race yeah. at each Olympics, and I remember the first one, <laughs> I I was just thinking. I'm going to destroy everybody because they, they, <laughs> they, and like I had that bravado, like yeah. when you're young, it's so easy to have that. Right. Mm-hmm. And uh, I remember thinking like they, and it was a pretty good situation where like no one knew who I was. My time was like, okay, but pretty like mediocre at the Olympics, you know, nobody had any like stress on me or anything. It was mm-hmm. the perfect situation to be at my first Olympics. Right. Um, where my last Olympics was like, everybody knows what I'm doing. Everybody knows that I've been doing this for 10 years. Like right. there's millions of people that have that expectation. Yeah. So very different from start to finish. Mm-hmm. Um, but I remember like I had a great, great race, um, at, for my prelims at, at my first Olympics. And that was such a stress off of just being like, okay, like I just took off 10 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> like life is good. You took off 10 seconds of your time. Yeah. And it's, it's so funny wow. because all the things you can and can't control, like my first Olympics, I remember I got my bronze medal, which was my goal. Like it's, I, Mm -hmm. that I wanted to get a medal. That was my ultimate goal. And I was so pissed that first place was in an outside lane and beat us by a second. Like it was a second and a half. Wow. And my time for prelims would have won, uh, finals, but all those little parts are just like, you don't know that. Like you can't, like, it's the power of hindsight. Like if I had known that I would have gone a little bit slower. So I had a bit more energy and like, Mm. but you can honestly just go too far down that rabbit hole, focusing on those things that are out of your control. Are you, are you pacing yourself in the, the 1500 or is it like a s- s- full-on sprint uh that one felt like a full-on sprint yeah uh and that one it was i guess at the time because i hadn't done that uh like uh time of my race that often mm-hmm. uh but by you know all the training that we do we can almost uh, every lap is within a tenth or two of a second of each other wow. which is kind of crazy like you're yeah. just like a metronome and you don't even have to think about it and you've just done enough meters that it's like mm. You'd just be like 29.7, 29.7, 29.7, 29.8, 29.7. And like, it doesn't make any sense that your body can, because it's 50, like it's 30 seconds. You'd think that it would like extrapolate out a little bit, but yeah. it's, you're, it's amazing what your body can accomplish when you put that much energy and time into practicing. And so you were saying that the, the person who won that race, they were in the outside lane, so you didn't, you weren't able to see them more. Or like- I was kind of in the middle where there was a lot of excitement, so there was three or four of us that were all within a second, uh, oh, okay. and so outside lane can be really good because you can see across the pool if you're by yourself, mm-hmm. uh, but if there's you know if there's splash and like you're focusing on those four people and right. usually those are the four fastest people. Um, 
in the middle or the yeah so it goes lane four lane five lane three lane six and, and kind of goes into v-shape out okay um and so you sometimes you just like again out of your control like right. how would you have known that that guy would have accomplished that but um, I think it was like so devastating in the moment when mm. it should have been such an exciting moment. Yeah, it's huge. <laughs> yeah, huge. But athletes are terrible for that. Like uh, yeah. every Olympics, it was like, you know, except my last. But in London, I remember getting off the podium and and talking to my coach about what we could do better for the next four years. And, mm. and sometimes you need to like take the moment to actually pat yourself on the back because yeah, it's you put a lot of energy into that. <laughs> totally. Was it? You had said earlier that you were kind of you'd finish a race. And then it's like, okay, what's, you know, let's prepare for next year or next year. Um, did you ever take time to really be in that moment and, you know, wow, like I, I, I did this or was it always still just going to the next, uh, next race? The, How'd you overcome that? Yeah. I mean, I had two, so I had two races at the Olympics, mm -hmm. um, and at world championships I had three. Uh, and it's interesting because either it went horrible and I had to <laughs> like just bury that really deep and say that I would think about it later, but never did right. and, and move on. Mm. Uh, or it went well, but then you're always picking it apart because you have to and, and right. because it's fresh. And so you write those things down you talk about it right away mm. thinking like, well, this like, cause you go a week or two, you kind of forget what the, you know, the third quarter of it was like, or like what right. this wall was like, right? Like, mm. so you have to do it right away, but it's, it was never this kind of like, I never found the equilibrium on that of mm. just being like, Oh, that was good. Like, let's be excited about it. And yeah. it was always pick it apart or never remember it again. <laughs> That's tough. So you never really had that, um, that relief of like, wow. No, uh, I, I shouldn't say that. I mean, I think at the lesser competitions when I was able to be on top of the podium, mm. it was like, yes, I could, I could have torn apart the race and told you a hundred things I did wrong, but you're yeah. like, okay, this feels good. Right. But it's kind of the sad part of sport that unless you're winning mm. a gold medal, you're always feeling a bit, I, I won't say like a loser, like it's yeah. because I don't think that's the case at all, but like, yeah. you always feel not quite great. Right. And, uh, it's at least now I can look back very positively on, you know, all of the aspects as a whole, mm. but at the time it was always like, Oh, what if, why isn't this better? And it's, right. it's kind of a, you can go down <laughs> yeah. not a great place. But I mean, it's crazy to think that like, you know, first Olympics bronze medal, that's in the whole world. Like that's, yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, and you always want more. Yeah, oh, I bet. <laughs> it's such a, like, yeah, it's, it's such a terrible part of sport of, mm. uh, uh, like, never being satisfied. Um, because if, and, and I think maybe that's what makes you a good athlete, is never mm. being satisfied. But, you know, I think sometimes you need to be excited and satisfied by something so that yeah. you know it was worth it instead of just, again, just what's next, what's next, what's next. Yeah, that's a tough thing. To, do you finally get, like, when you finally decided to, um, retire from from competitive swimming did you did you get uh, kind of a relief in that or how did that feel i mean my last olympics did not go the way i, I had hoped at mm -hmm. all um and so i think it took me quite a few months again it actually was more along the lines of i'm not going to think about that <laughs> for right. a while and uh and i gave myself enough time that i could look back on it and i, I mean i wish i knew what didn't go right mm -hmm. um and always yeah. that was probably the biggest hurdle to overcome when i retired was knowing that i didn't have any more chances so every year it was like, okay, you got second or you got third or whatever that looks like, or you got sixth, it, but you always had the next year to like try to progress. Right. And so when I retired, it was like, nope, that's it. You have no more chances. Like mm. you have to be okay with how you did, mm. uh, or else you're going to be, you know, unhappy forever. And I think finding a new career that I could, this is hard for athletes is yeah. you're an athlete for so long and that's what you, uh, identify with. Mm -hmm. So when you have to find almost a new identity, it, you're you're always looking back on like the what ifs should I go back like could I have done better like yeah and you see that all the time with athletes who haven't been able to redefine themselves where mm. I've been really happy that I have been able to do that so now I can look back thinking that was great like uh, yeah. and it's not about the medal it's like I think back of like what was my motivation to want that gold medal and it's like mm. uh, to show everybody that I could do it like to show myself that I could do it like mm. was it for the fame for the money like and it's I don't have an answer for that and and so you're kind of like well who cares then? <laughs> yeah, it's, and it, you know, it was great while, it, like, it, you have to be able to look as a, a whole book, not just as, like, a chapter that didn't go right. Right. Well, and it, not that it didn't go, like, it, those chapters went pretty good. <laughs> they didn't go, yeah. Didn't, I didn't ever reach what I wanted to reach. Right. That's probably a better way to say it. How do you deal, how do you deal with that? How did you, 
uh, you know, transitioning then from having these goals and having that next year, next year, next year. Um, how did how did you handle that? Not being able to, or coming to to grips that that kind of chapter was was finishing up and then transitioning to something new, real estate in your uh, um, in your regard. Uh, I think it would have been hard if I still had one foot in, one foot out. So mm -hmm. a lot of athletes will, will follow results. So they're all, like, they're always kind of keeping an eye on things. Coaching or something as well. Is that yeah, yeah. Of... Like and and being always being informed, I think would be tough. Where mm -hmm. I kind of, I had a couple friends that were still competing, but in reality, it's like it was out of sight, out of mind. So I could focus right. on just trying to progress in what my career was at the time, and and so trying to and. and it, that's probably the hardest is when you're new at something you're like yeah. wow this is hard and wow i have a lot to learn and all those things and so then you're always kind of like oh maybe i should go back like it was pretty good even if i didn't get the results i wanted right but in reality i knew like i was very aware that it was going to be a good year to three years that mm -hmm. you have to learn uh and then you'll get to like that point of not mastery but you'll start to feel like you're mastering certain prospects of your job and right i think when you get to that point you're like okay like that's good. Hmm. Like, I feel good about it. Did you, was it your choice to, to retire or was it something like was in age as well or is it how? <laughs> good question. Because yeah. I think that's uh, probably one of the biggest points that makes mm -hmm. a difference is if you get injured and pushed out, you're always going to have that what if kind right. of option. Uh, where for me, it was totally my, my, well, I mean, it was my age. <laughs> yeah, uh, but like your, it, it was your decision. Then. It was absolutely my decision to mm. decide to, when to be done. And so because I, I mean, athletes are always control freaks. So yeah. it, like, if you feel like you had control over that, mm -hmm. um, then you're just, it's an easier choice and you feel better about it long term. Yeah, that, yeah. That, that's empowering itself just absolutely. to have that, have that choice. Yeah. What, uh, what sort of advice do you have to, to athletes who are facing that, um, that time in their life where they're, you know, they've been training for so long um and they're they're reaching the end of their career how do you what kind of advice do you have for them just have self-patience yeah um whether you're starting a job whether you're a new parent whether you're mm. transitioning out of sport like all those things i think are you know don't feel like you have to have the right answer don't feel like you have to be good right away like mm. don't be afraid to make mistakes like all those things that you almost forget about because you've been an athlete for so long where you perfected what you're doing. Totally. Uh, and you forget what it's like to be new. And yeah. so uh, I you, have, you've been, you've been one of the best and then all of a yeah. sudden now being, being new and being, you know, yeah. struggling. You to, went from the top 1% to the bottom 1%. Yeah. Right? And, uh, I think it's, I always focused on, you're going to make bigger leaps and bounds at that bottom 1% mm -hmm. and just be excited about that process and right. know that it's going to be bumpy. But, um, know that you're going to be able to get back there as long as you have that long-term vision but it's just think of what it was like when you're starting anything new at when yeah. you were a kid right like it was rough but it, it's easy to forget because it's yeah so almost many, so almost rougher ago. now starting new things as an adult yeah. right? because that you're you're not learning as fast you don't have as much time uh, yeah, yeah but i almost think that's just our reference point right yeah, like totally. it's like we're pulled in more different directions mm. uh it seems harder because it seems longer but as a kid it probably felt the same way right yeah and so it's don't fall into fallacies of, uh, you know, it was easier because I had more or less going on kind of thing. Like, I mm. think we are, ha in life, we have a lot more going on now, but if you really, really focus on something, mm. you can do it. It's just most of us don't, or have a hard time choosing to do that focus. Right. And did you have uh, an idea of what you wanted to do when you were retiring? You had an idea you wanted to get into real estate? or? Uh, well, I did want to get into real estate, but there was no work-life balance. So then I said, I want a desk job. Uh, right. And so I worked for a local software company, okay. um, which was on paper great. I had I worked with awesome people. Um, I you know I was a, a partner there. and, mm. and Were you doing like coding and stuff? Or no. You... Oh, okay. <laughs> Bigger picture, less. Yeah. Yeah, because I don't have a background in coding. <laughs> okay, that's what uh, I was like, yeah. wow. And, uh, busy guy. The, and I, I tried that, and it... it it should have made sense. And mm -hmm. I just, like, I worked with people who were so passionate about what they were doing. Right. And I thought, oh, well, I'll learn that passion because mm -hmm. it's new to me, right? And have that patience. And after kind of 18 months, I was like, I just don't think that this is what I'm passionate about. And mm -hmm. yeah, I was doing a disservice to the people I was working with because if I didn't have the same passion as them, like, they deserve right. to have somebody that did. And so I went from wanting a work life balance to just thinking, I have to be passionate about what I'm doing and then mm -hmm. find the work life balance around it. And, right. And real estate offered that for sure. And what, um, how did you get into real estate itself? Like, did you have 
some connections or did it, how did it work? Uh, you know, it's, uh, I didn't really have any connections. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's your own business, right? Yeah. So it's, uh, I had worked with agents before and that's mm -hmm. how I got connected with Jason who owns uh, the agency here in Victoria. But, uh, it's, it was more take the course, mm -hmm. try to get business, try to learn as fast as you can. And, yeah. and it's just, I describe it as just a constant hustle because yeah. <laughs> it's, you know, as soon as you get one client, you might work with them for years and nothing can happen or mm. things happen fast, things happen slow. It's, it's a very exciting industry, but it's also like a slog sometimes just trying to uh, learn, get business and, and be a good advocate for the people you're working with. What did you find um, that kind of transferred over from your time as an elite athlete, training really hard, um, were there any skills that you found transferred over or the building habits and things like that? Uh, I mean, the, the habitual part for sure. Mm -hmm. um, the being able to see the long-term goal and not be overwhelmed at the yeah. beginning was a big one. Um, patience and whether that came from sport or not, but I knew that I had to be patient with myself, mm -hmm. uh, learning something new and knowing that it wasn't going to happen in the first month. And right. I remember thinking I was, I was talking to my cousin is also uh, a realtor and uh, he's, you know, he's like, you know, it's a hard first, like three to five. And I was like, oh God, please say months, please say months. And he's like, years. <laughs> and it's like, I knew yeah. that. And like, yeah. I knew it was going to be, you're in it for the long haul. And I can totally see myself doing this for 40 years. Like I absolutely yeah. can see that, which is Sweet. exciting. Right? Yeah. Uh, but I was, but you know, you want things to happen now. Totally. <laughs> and so sport, I think makes you a bit impatient because you're mm -hmm. so used to things happening quicker than slower right. or uh, seeing that progress you know yeah you and measuring yourself and giving the feedback and like right. all those things that you don't get in the real world mm. uh and i think uh, i have a degree in psych and then a project management diploma and they really applied to like the soft skills so how to run your business how mm. to deal with people how to like uh you know keep moving forward and keep having those goals and so i think all of that worked very well together right and created a good harmony where i was able to learn quickly but mm. i i honestly think it's more i work with a very very good group of people uh and we have a smaller office so it's mm. it's communal we have a community around what we're doing yeah. um it's exciting you have that support uh, and so all those things were just the perfect storm that i think helped me quite substantially well that's a long uh I, 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 real estate seems like a a difficult thing to get into at first with uh, it's just, just so much oh, there's a lot of realtors. freedom. Yeah, and a lot of realtors. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. So there's, I mean, there's a lot of freedom. Like mm -hmm. you can, uh, and a lot of people, I mean, there's 1,600 realtors in Victoria. Uh, wow. And a lot of people only work part time. Uh, mm -hmm. That was of no interest to me. I mean, totally makes sense why people do that. But yeah. to me, I was like, this is a career. I want to do this full time. I want to always be available. Mm -hmm. I want to see how far I can, I, I can take this. Uh, and so it's, you know, it, it is a community, but there is that competition piece, and mm. but I also thrive on that competition piece, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> so it's I, I think I found that in a good, health, well, healthy mm. most of the time way. Yeah. And so that makes you want to get out, put your feet on the ground, and actually be happy. I think mm. my coach would be proud. <laughs> I bet, yeah. yeah. Are, you, are you still waking up at 4 o'clock in the morning? No, yeah. no way. The day has shifted. Yeah, yeah that's good. Up later and then up later. <laughs> how, how did you find, so you said you had a, a, um, a degree in psych and then a diploma in project management as yeah. well? How did you find the time to do that? My degree took eight years yeah. uh, with a couple of years off in there for like Olympic years. I didn't go to school, mm -hmm. um, but you just work school around that. And uh, that's a good actually point for younger athletes is know what you're uh, deciding to focus on. And so a lot of athletes are like, I want to go to med school and I want to go to the Olympics. And you're like, mm -hmm. that's so some people do it, but it's yeah. a very, very small number that do it. And if you do want to do that, choose what your focus is every year. And so for mm -hmm. me, it was always sport was number one, school fit around that, uh, right. which isn't the choice for everybody for sure. Mm. Uh, and so after, you know, I graduated, then it's just, I had a good opportunity for this, uh, project management thing. And I was like, Hey, this is applicable. It, same as my side degree, applicable to everything, but also yeah. applicable to nothing <laughs> in particular. Right. <laughs> and, but that's school, right? Like yeah. it taught me how to learn. It taught me how to memorize things. It mm. taught me it, all these skills that I think I, I really utilize today, but yeah. specifically you asked me anything about my degree and I'm like, it, <laughs> totally. A lot it, of it's yeah. sometimes memorization and then regurgitation, but the, I like you said that too, the hard skills of learning how to, how to learn, learning how to study is one of those things that I feel like was never taught at all it was like okay study for this and you're like okay and you're like how exactly am i supposed to do yeah. that it's like yeah. a personal thing that you have to kind of develop over time that's a good point like it's yeah. uh, 
the courses in high school, how to study, mm. personal finance. Oh, yeah. Like, uh, nutrition or something. Nutrition. Sort of health. Yeah, uh, since, like, psychology and, like, social yeah. mental health. Like, those are all things that would make, like, our students such better, like, parts of our community, oh, yeah. but they're all kind of a bit lackluster at this point in time. Yeah. I, I think about it two ways, because I, I, part of me fully agrees with that. Uh, those exact courses that, man, it'd be nice to learn more about that. But then I kind of remember myself at that age, I just don't think I gave a shit. Like, I just like, uh, you know, like you're, you're just, you're, you're not aware of what real life is going to be like. It's true. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But it's like, do we teach our kids about... You know, like, it's... How to use a graphing calculator. There's yeah. certain things in school where, like, could that be replaced? I don't know, but uh, it's... Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's tough. Like, it's hard as parents. How do you find the time to actually teach those kids your, like, oh, yeah. those skills when, when you're, you're a full-time trying, job and yeah. you're, like, a, yeah... You're trying to figure it out yourself. Yeah, so maybe that's what university and a lot of mm. high school is for, is, again, teaching how to how to learn and, and figure out what you're interested in. Yeah. After the, uh, the Olympics and stuff, you kind of inevitably get pushed into almost a, a role model uh, role. How did you find that? Uh, I thought it was great. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, it's funny because I remember up until my first Olympics, I loved yeah. being kind of in the, in the background. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I was a silent leader for a long time uh, because I wanted to lead by example, but I didn't really know what the right thing to say was. Mm -hmm. I was terrified I'd influence people the wrong way. And then right. after a couple of years, you just you start thinking about what do you want uh, your legacy to be and how do you want to lead the sport and all mm. those things where I wanted to talk about winning I wanted to have Canadians think about uh, success in a different way mm -hmm. but then I also wanted to be you know pretty well-rounded pretty positive like all those things that took a long time to